thanks for attending this talk about adding live interactive video to your application with Amazon Interactive Video Service. I go back and forth between adding interactive live video and adding live interactive video, so I'm, this is kind of what I've settled on for now, but here's our agenda. We're going to talk about what IVS is, why you might want to use it, and then we're going to start looking at the SDKs for interactive video service. We're going to look at creating a channel, getting started with broadcasting, how to play back your live stream videos, and then take a look at a little bit about interactivity and some of the various features that are available to you with interactive video service. This is me, I'm Todd Sharp, I'm a full stack developer, been one since 2004, back when we just called ourselves developers. And I'm a developer advocate at Twitch. You can find me on Twitter, YouTube, my blog, I blog a lot lately on Dev2. I don't blog so much on my personal blog anymore, but I've been blogging a lot on Dev2, as well as GitHub. Recursive code's pretty much every social media platform. I also do a weekly live stream on twitch.tv slash AWS. It's called Streaming on Streaming. Go figure. And again, it's at 4 p.m. Eastern on Wednesdays, 1 p.m. Pacific. Let's take a little look at the numbers, live streaming by the numbers. Just to kind of give you an idea of the impact that live streaming has had, particularly in the last few years since COVID, 63% of people ages 18 to 34 watch live streaming content regularly. How many of us watch a live stream on Twitch or on YouTube or, okay, that's about 63% of us. Live content, live content earns 27% more minutes of watch time compared to video on demand. It's a pretty impressive fact. 80% of consumers prefer to watch live videos from a brand rather than lead a blog, read a blog. 79%, you can see the numbers here. Live streaming is growing rapidly. It's becoming impossible to ignore. But there's one more stat that I find personally mind-blowing. And that's the number of Gen Z people who will search TikTok over Google when they're trying to learn something. Does anybody have a guess on that number? I have a pair of socks for you if you guess. Was that? 61%. Any other guesses? 90. You're the winner because it's 40%. It may seem low, but to me that seems high. You're going to search TikTok or Instagram when you're trying to learn about a topic. You want, you want your socks, by the way? I got a pair of socks for you. All right. 40% of Gen Z prefers using TikTok or Instagram for search over Google. So what I'm trying to share here is that live streaming video in particular is becoming a very powerful tool and it's becoming, as I said, impossible to ignore. What is interactive video service? Essentially, it's a platform, a service for you to build your own live streaming experiences, similar to what you might find on a website like Twitch. This is the marketing ease type fancy slide that we use when we're trying to tell people about interactive video service. Essentially, it's broadcasting from one creator to multiple viewers, right? Something like Twitch or Amazon Live Shopping, if you've ever used that. Or maybe you have a GoPro camera, and if you didn't know, you could live stream from your GoPro directly to the web. So essentially, it's this live streaming experience. We have all kinds of features. You can auto-record your streams to S3 buckets. You can use timed metadata, which is a really cool feature that we're gonna take a look at in a little bit. You can create private channels that authorize, basically authorize playback for only authorized users so that you can protect who's viewing your streams. All kinds of really cool features and it's really easy to use. And I know I'm supposed to say that because I'm a developer advocate for the service, but I'm telling you, as we'll see in some of the code samples, it's really easy to get started with and really easy to use. Why IVS? You tell me. 
You're the ones building applications. Why do you, why do you want to add interactive video to your website? Do you want to create the next user-generated content platform? Maybe you want to make a Twitch for cycling or a Twitch for programmers. Hey, that idea is free. You can take that and use that. Um, conferences, something like this. This camera right here could be using interactive video service to stream this conference and extend the reach of this conference to not only the people sitting in the room, but virtual users across the globe with low latency as well. Let's talk a little bit about the elephant in the room. So you've all used, probably familiar with Twitch. YouTube Live has an offering, Instagram, everybody, Twitter, everybody has a free live streaming option that you could use. So why would you wanna pay for something like interactive video service instead of just using Twitch? And that's a fair question. If you want to reach an audience with a live stream and you want to embed the player in your blog or your website and that works for you, that's fine. Do it, I have no problem with that. Please, please use Twitch, but absolutely there are use cases for the free solutions that are out there. When you wanna use something like IBS is when you wanna customize that experience. You wanna add interactivity that you can't get through one of those out of the box solutions. You wanna custom brand your player. You wanna use custom chat moderation, for example. All of these things that your application needs to do that you can't do with the free solutions. So is this for everything? No, it's not for everything. Is it for specific use cases, for building user-generated content platforms? Absolutely perfect, and as you'll see, not too bad to use. So why not just roll your own, though? There's open source media software out there, streaming servers. You could do that. You could go tomorrow and spin up an EC2 instance and install, I'm not gonna say names, but there are open source streaming softwares out there that you could use. Sure, you could do that. If you want to create the instance, you want to manage the OS updates, you want to install Java, open firewall ports, VPC ports, manage the network, install the media server, create the services, write any code, custom code on top of that uh, open source solution, add auto scan, look, if you want to do this, you're more than welcome to. I've done it. Granted, it was a long time ago, but it's not fun. It's a lot of work. And at the end of the day, that bottom bullet point is the big one. The last item in that list, the network. If you wanted to roll your own media server and you wanted to have low latency, high quality video globally, that's gonna be a problem. It's gonna be difficult. Why is that? The network is hard to crack. Let's talk about a typical web request. If you go to your command line right now and you do a trace route to any website, you'll get a list of all the hops that it takes to get to that server. If you take that list and you pull all the IPs out of it and you go to a free geolocation website to geolocate all those IP addresses and you map it out, you might see something like this. Now this is, I live up in Blairsville, up in uh, the north part of Georgia, up by North Carolina, Tennessee, up there. So I did this request for one of my sites that's in an EC2 instance in US East. And I mapped out the IPs. And this one went from Blairsville to Richmond, Virginia, and then up to the DC area where the data center is. That's not too bad, right? You ever make a request to a site in another world, another country, another world? Yeah, I make requests to Mars all the time. Another country? So I did a request to Brazil. <laughs> I, I, I still can't believe this. My request went from Georgia to West Virginia to DC to Berlin, then to California, and then down to Brazil. This is just the way some of our traffic gets routed on the internet. It took 529 milliseconds. It was a simple HTML page, not a lot going on, but there's some massive, especially cross-Atlantic backbones that are involved in delivering your traffic when you make a simple HTTP request. It seems seamless to you because it's traveling at most times at the speed of light across the Atlantic and then back across the Atlantic and then down to Brazil. But if you think about live streamed video, 
this isn't going to work. Your latency needs are not going to be met by a request that's going from DC to Berlin to California down to Brazil. If you have viewers in Brazil, you want a network that's prioritized and purpose built for the delivery of live streamed video. So IBS, Interactive Video Service, has a series of POPs and data centers across the world that are custom built for delivering this kind of traffic. They take out all of those unnecessary hops, we cache your video at edge-based CDNs, and it's just built for live streamed video at a global scale. If you wanna roll your own, this is what you're gonna mostly miss out on. This network is purpose-built that delivers one two to five seconds of latency globally, usually around one second in my testing. So let's look at the AWS SDKs for ABS and IBS, enough, enough background information. How are we doing on time? Pretty good. Let's look at some of the SDKs for IBS. So SDKs, like many AWS services, we have your favorite language is most likely gonna be supported. I'm sure many of you are Go users, right? Because that's, no? Oh, okay. Uh, JavaScript, TypeScript, Node.js. Any Python users? Some Python users. I like Python. I, I love Python. I just need to find a good project to work on. Maybe I should do something for this. PHP, does anyone still use PHP? Nice. So pretty much all your favorite languages are gonna be supported. What can you do with these SDKs? We have two different clients. One is the IBS client, which is all of the core video services. And what can you do with those? Anything channel related. And we'll look at what channels are. We're gonna create a channel in just a minute. Any kind of CRUD operation on channels. You can create them, you can read them, update them, delete them, list them. Stream keys, stream keys are essentially a way to authorize your channel for your client for broadcasting to a channel. Playback key pairs, if you have authorized playback, there's a public and private key pair that are used to authorize and sign the request to make sure that that person is uh, authorized to view that stream. Recording configurations, if you want to record to S3, times metadata, all of that stuff can be done with the IVS client. We also have an IVS chat client. Anything chat related, create, list, update, delete chat rooms, create chat tokens. You can also delete messages and disconnect users, which is really handy. There's another way to do this with our chat messaging APIs. We're not gonna get into that today, but anything chat related can be done on the server side with the IVS chat client. So let's create a channel. Let's jump right into it and actually see how to create a channel with Amazon Interactive Video Services. Um, my next slide is just a picture of the console and we're gonna go to the console, so let's go to the console. Y'all see that okay? Thank you. So to create a channel, the first thing you'll do is you'll come to the Interactive Video Service um, console in the AWS console and I'm not gonna show it here, but the first thing you'll see is a region selection screen. You'll have to select a region. Once you do that, you'll come to this page. This lists all of your channels in IBS. Now, if you're creating a user-generated content platform, something like a Twitch or something like that, you're most likely gonna be using the SDK to create the channel. When a user signs up for their new account, you'll use the SDK, you'll create a channel, save that information from that channel in your database, but for demo purposes or just one-off channel creation, let's say your application just needs one channel, you can come into the console and create that channel directly in here. So we'll call this Connect Tech Demo. The next thing we have to do is select the channel configuration. There's a default configuration and there's the ability to customize that. The default configuration gives you a standard channel type gives you ultra low latency and it disables playback authorization. So that public private key pair that you can use to authorize playback. What is the difference between a standard channel and a basic channel? It has to do with what happens to your video when it gets to our data centers. When you are uploading or ingesting video into our data centers, a standard channel will transcode your video. And what transcoded video means is let's say you're uploading 1080p video 
Transcoding will create different outputs based on um, different delivery formats, different sizes of video. So you have a 1080 out, 720 out, 480 out, and a 360 out. So if, you're, if you watch a lot of Twitch and you follow some big live, big popular streamer, a partner, Twitch partner, they're gonna have transcoded video. And that means it's gonna be the best quality, highest bit rate, lowest latency, and it's also adaptive. So the nice thing about a transcoded stream is if you're reaching somebody in a part of the world that has poor internet or maybe on a mobile connection, they can, they're, the player on their end can choose a lower quality feed to reduce buffering. So it's all about that lowest latency possible. So the transcoded feed will give you all of those different outputs in your, on your channel. Now a basic channel will give you what's called transmuxing. And transmuxing does not change the shape of the video, it just changes the format of the video. Transcoding changes the format as well. But transmuxing will take a 1080 in and it'll give you a 1080 out. It'll take a 720 in, it'll give you 720 out. So there's no actual change to the video quality resolution, just the format. So when you're uploading, you have to ingest as RTMP, and for delivery to the web, it has to be HLS. So it just changes that format. That's the difference between standard and basic. So let's leave it as the default configuration. We can also configure whether we want to record or store our streams. I'm gonna leave it disabled. As I said, you can auto record to S3 and we can click create channel. As soon as we do this, we're ready to go. We have a channel that's been created and we have various artifacts that are created that we're going to need to either work with the SDK or broadcast to this channel. Those things are the ARN, Amazon resource name, which is located right here, just a unique identifier that specifies this channel. If you want to perform any actions with the SDK, you'll use this ARN so that the SDK knows which channel you wanna work with. Down here, when we go to stream to our channel, this is the information we're gonna need. We're gonna need, if you're, has anybody broadcast to Twitch? Okay, so you're familiar with stream keys. You go into your console, you have to have a stream key, you need an RTMP endpoint, you plug those into OBS. Same concept here. You have a stream key and you have an ingest server. This is the ingest server for RTMP. If you're using something like OBS, Streamlabs, GStreamer, some of the other desktop streaming software, you'll use this RTMP endpoint and your stream key. We also have an option that hopefully we'll get a chance to look at today if we don't run out of time, and that is using web ingest. So we have a web broadcast SDK that lets you create a broadcast experience directly in your browser without the need for something like OBS and Streamlabs, which can be kind of confusing. I mean, they're not terribly complex, but they can be kind of confusing for someone who's brand new to streaming. Now I have to learn this new streaming software and learn how that works. No, you can come in, you can access your webcam, your microphone, stream directly from the web, and if you're gonna use that web broadcast SDK, this is the endpoint that you'll use for that. If you notice, it's essentially the same endpoint without the prefix and without the port slash app. So it will always be that. You shouldn't say always, you never say always. Playback configuration. So when it comes to playback and you wanna use our player SDK to play back your live stream, this is the URL that you'll use for that. You also have a list of stream sessions. So if you have past stream sessions on this channel, they will all be listed here. You can drill into those, get a little more information about that stream, which is super nice. And this section here I didn't show is another nice thing. If we were streaming on this channel right now, we could actually preview it directly in the console right here. Really nice, easy. You don't even have to set up your own player. You just come in here and click play. So let's actually do that. Let's go into OBS and we'll copy our ingest server. So if I go into OBS, in order to broadcast to IBS, normally you would come in here, you'd select Twitch. I know it's impossible to see, I'm sorry for that. I'll try to read it to you so you know what it's saying. This drop down here is basically a list of all the services that um, you can stream to with OBS. So you have Twitch, you have YouTube, Facebook Live, all those various services. There is an option for custom. So you select custom 
and you can paste in that RTMP server, come back and grab our stream key, and paste that in. Oh, I know it's show, I shouldn't do that. I will delete this channel so that you can all not. <laughs> Uh, all right, so that's it. We're set up, we're ready to stream. Let's click start streaming and pray that nothing crashes the internet while we're standing here. So we give it just a second or two to build up a little bit in the buffer. We re reload this page. Where did it go? Oh, there we go. And that's it. We're live streaming. Because we're on conference Wi-Fi, We've got about three or four seconds of latency there. Not terrible uh, for, for an amazing conference Wi-Fi, but as you can see, we're live. Our status is healthy. The duration is here. We have one viewer. Why are you all not watching this right now? Um, there's also something down here called time metadata. We're gonna, we're gonna look at that in just a second. So let's stop that stream and minimize that down. Grab a drink of water. Any questions so far? Yes, sir. The question is, uh, when you select save to an S3 bucket, what happens, right? So that does get, I, I don't want to say complex. But there is kind of a, a process to it. So what it does is it'll create a bucket for you. This document will, will explain everything that happens. It will save to that bucket, every time you start a stream, some JSON files that give you information about some meta about the file, recording start, recording stopped. And it'll also save all of your playlists, the, the HLS playlists, and the media related to those playlists into the bucket. So you can use the SDKs, or you can even just go in there and look at it, read it, grab the, UR, the playlist URL, and you can plug it in for playback. Now I hesitate when I say that, because it will create, as it should, it will create a private bucket. And you can't just expose that private bucket to the web. What you'll need to do is create a cloud, uh, cloud front distribution, I'm trying to think of the word, and it'll access origin, access that CDN, and expose it via a CDN for playback. So it's not just you get an MP4 and plug it into a player. There's a little bit of a process, but it's not, it's not complex. It's just security is obviously a priority. You don't want to just let anybody list that bucket. Thank you. Good question. Where are we at? Okay, so we created a channel. Can we do that with a CLI? I'm glad you asked. Of course you can create, do that with the CLI. To do that, we can use IVS, create channel, give it a name, specify a latency mode, the type of channel, whether or not you want playback authorization, hit enter, that's gonna give you a JSON object containing all of that information that you need, your stream key, your endpoints, your ARN, all of that good stuff. So yes, we can do that with the CLI. Now let's look at how to do that with the SDK. Everybody's favorite time, it's time for live coding. So we're going to first, uh, actually what I didn't show you here is that I've already NPM installed the IBS client behind the scene. So in order to create a channel with the SDK, we're gonna import the client. We are going to create an instance of the client. Create an input object. And in the input object, we're going to give it a name. We are going to specify the latency mode and the type. So standard channel, which gives me transcoding, low latency. Create a command. which uses the create channel command, pass it the input, and then we're going to send the command 
using async await so we don't get a promise back and have to mess with that. So since this is node, I'm gonna do a top level await and we're gonna do client.send, send it the command, and then log the response. Five bucks says it runs without any errors. Am I in the right directory? I'm in the right directory. And let's look at, oh. <laughs> all right. We're gonna look at the final solution <laughs> every time, right? Instead of troubleshooting that live. All right, I must have typoed something. So in our response, every time, right? In our response, we get a channel object as the ARN. Don't copy that stream key. Where is it? There it is at the bottom. So we get the ingest endpoint, we get the latency mode, just all of that information that we got in the console, our playback URL, all that fun stuff, we get that back. So again, if you're creating a user-generated content platform, a new user signs up, you call this with the SDK, you grab all those values, you stick them in a database. Now you have your admin page, you show them the stream key, their ingest endpoint, all of that good stuff. They're ready to start streaming to your amazing user-generated content platform, right? So you can do it with the console, you can do it with the CLI, you can do it with the SDKs. If you like Java, use the Java. If you like Python, do that. CLI, whatever you want to do, you can do. So again, we talked about this, the channel artifacts are the channel ARN, the ingest endpoint, the stream key, and the playback URL. We did look at broadcasting a little bit. Here are, is a more comprehensive list of your broadcast options with IVS. You can use, again, desktop streaming software. You can uh, broadcast directly from FFmpeg. So right from the command line, you could cast the magic incantation of FFmpeg command line arguments, does anybody fully understand FFmpeg arguments? They are the most cryptic, <laughs> kinda, they're a little cryptic, but they're actually in our docs, there is a, a copy paste command that you could use to, to broadcast directly via FFmpeg. It's kinda nice though for certain use cases to use something from the command line to just, for example, if you have a pre-recorded video that you wanted to live stream on your channel, that's a good tool to use for it, FFmpeg. We do have an Android broadcast SDK and iOS broadcast SDK. Also, we talked about the web broadcast SDK. There are also hardware encoders. There's mobile apps. There are IP cameras that you can broadcast directly to RTMP endpoints. Just about anything that produces RTMP can broadcast to an IBS channel. We did look at OBS broadcast already. Let's take a Quick look at web broadcast. How do we want to do this? Let's look at my demo. So this is an application that I've built. And instead of looking at my silly face while I talk, I just have a pre-recorded stream that's basically a virtual webcam that's broadcasting here. And what we have here is a canvas element on the page that you can use to present, obviously, when someone's broadcasting, it's a good idea to show them a little preview of what they're sending out to the world, right? So when I click broadcast at this point, this should, in theory, be broadcasting to my channel, and it is. So there's another option here in the console on the left-hand side here, live channels. Any channel that's currently broadcasting, you can click that and then you'll get a little card for every single channel that's currently broadcasting live. You can also actually stop a stream directly from the console via this tool. You can also do that via the SDK or the CLI. So if whatever reason, uh, actually there's a good use case for this. Let's say, so when I broadcast on the Twitch 
.tv slash AWS channel. That's a channel that's shared among all AWS developer relations team members. So we all have a shared stream key that we plug into our streaming software and broadcast. Well, let's say I'm just really, really fired up one day and I'm just talking and talking and I'm going like way over my time slot. Someone else is waiting. This would be a good kind of use case. If somebody, if you're using a shared key and somebody has gone over their time slot, this would be a use case for that. So you could even, like I said, use the SDK to do it. So you have an admin panel in your application, have, build this feature right into it. So you can click on that live channel. And this is my live broadcast from that web broadcast tool. Now, how does this happen? What does this do? This, the web broadcast, let me mute that because I hear myself talking back. Um, this uses WebRTC. So from the browser to our data center, the stream is ingested as WebRTC. It gets converted to RTMP in the data center. From the data center going out to the client, it gets converted to HLS. So again, a really nice feature to add to your application if you don't want to send your users elsewhere to a desktop streaming software. How do you do that? Quickly, we'll look at the SDK. You import the library, use IVS Broadcast Client.create. You pass it a stream configuration, which is essentially the format of your video, basic, standard, landscape, portrait. Um, you can also specify the resolution if you want to do that. You plug in your ingest endpoint, and it's a little more work because you do have to, number one, get permissions in your browser, obviously, to access a webcam or a microphone. You need your, your user permissions, so you use um, get user media to do that. You can set up a stream preview, so you have a Canvas element, like I said. You get an, a reference to that element, and then you use client.attach preview and you pass it that element. That's it. You have a live preview of your stream that's about to be broadcasted. You have to attach those devices to the client, so you want to use enumerate devices or one of the other methods to grab a hold of all your various devices. I use enumerate devices to build this drop down that you see here. So it's nice to always have an option to, to let the user change their camera, change their microphone, and give them the option to which camera that they want to use for their broadcast. So you use enumerate devices, and then you can retrieve your media stream, again using get user media, passing it the device ID. And I suggest always that, passing that device ID because I've seen some kind of weird things happen when you don't. I see a nod over there. Um, and then you add the device to the stream. Use client.add video input device or client.add audio input device. Once you have your client created, your streams added from your microphone and your camera, you can then start a broadcast. You use the start broadcast method, which returns a promise. You pass it a stream key. I don't recommend <laughs> coding your stream key in your you know, right into your JavaScript because that would be a bad thing. Obviously, you'd probably pull that from a backend or something or some other secure method. And then once you get that result, you know that you're broadcasting. How do you stop a broadcast? I'm gonna give you one guess how you stop a broadcast. You call stop broadcast on the client. You can swap video positions. So if you want to have a preview on the side of a second camera, for example, and you wanted to be able to, so you have a preview of all your cameras on the side, for example, and you wanted to swap them in and out, you can do that, which is nice. You can also, not shown here in the documentation, you can also share your screen. So let's show that really quick, which is trademark super awesome. So let's share this screen. Come on now. Okay, there we go. So you can share your screen directly to your stream. If you go to 
stream.ivs.rocks, actually. This is kind of a neater option for this. So very similar tool to the one I was just using, but if you share your screen here, I like the way they show it because as you can see here, they do a little picture in picture. So they, it shows basically how you can add more than one video device at a time onto that canvas. So you can have your, just like you always see in Twitch, you know, your, your video in the bottom right corner, whatever corner you want, your desktop, let's say you're gaming or whatever, you could do that kind of experience. So it's, you can also add images to your stream, static images, GIFs. You can also do canvases. So if, for example, you wanted to add some text over top of your stream, you know, maybe like a lower third that says uh, whoever's broadcasting at that moment, you could add canvases with the web broadcast tool. So it's very powerful, very flexible. You can create experiences in the browser that are not just webcam, not just, you know, mic, live talking into the screen. You can create some really interactive experiences. We are at 12.06, okay. That is web broadcast. Let's talk about playback. So playback, as we've already seen, let me stop anything else that I'm broadcasting or sharing here, just to save on resources. All right, excellent. Let's talk about playback. So back in the console, if you remember the console, if you remember the SDK output or the CLI output, we have this playback URL. The playback URL, as I said, is what you use to create a playback experience on your channel. So let's temp fate again and <laughs> live code a player. So I have a simple HTML page here. Simple. I have an HTML page here. Any questions so far? No questions. Excellent. Yes, sir. Yes, absolutely. The question is, is there any support for captioning, either auto or something you provide? There is. And that's another really cool thing. Thank you. I, I should have actually mentioned that. There is a way to add captions to your stream. And there is a way to listen for them. I don't have it in this demo off, offhand, but I do have a blog post that goes over that on dev.2 slash recursive codes. And essentially, it's a... So it's a little tricky with the live stream, obviously, you know, but there is a way to use, I believe it's recognition, AWS recognition, or is it Kinesis? It's one of those. If you go to ibs.rocks and go to the examples, there is a full-blown solution that, does, that shows you live captioning. I've done it with pre-recorded streams that have captions built in. Essentially, it's just a listener that you do on the player side to listen for that tap text caption event, and it brings it, so you'll obviously have to overlay it yourself with a canvas element or a div or whatever on top of your video, but you, there is a way to listen for the actual time when a caption comes in and then display it. And as I said, go to ibs.rocks and look at the examples and look for the live caption demo. There is a way to do that. So let's live code a player. We'll start off by declaring a, setting a stream URL. And I have a snippet for that. So this is my demo channel that I use all the time. So up here we have a script tag on line 11. Is that size okay for y'all? We include the IBS player script on line 11 just as an include. Once we do that, we have access to the IVS player object. And these four lines are how we create a player. We have a video element on the screen. If I scroll down, you'll see it's just a regular HTML video tag. We use IVS player.create to create an instance of the player. We attach the HTML video element, passing it the DOM element. We call load, passing our stream URL, our playback URL from our channel. And then we call play. What can we do at this point? We can listen for various events directly on the IVS player. So if we say IVS player at event listener, 
and we listen for the player state dot playing. So this is a map of various constant ver uh, values that you can use. And we log just the word playing. So we can listen for the playing event. Why would you want to do this? Maybe you wanted to create a status little, like I had in my demo, a little status badge that says playing so that people know that the channel's live or offline. You could toggle that here. You can listen for the stream end event. You can listen for stream errors as well. I didn't, uh, we're not demoing that, but if you have any errors, your stream is not playing, for example, or if you go to a page and this, nobody's broadcasting on that channel at that point, it will throw an error immediately. So what I've done in some demos is I just create a set interval and I just keep polling that so that you don't have to reload the page when the channel goes live. I just, every few seconds, I poll, try to hit play again, and I handle that by using an on-air listener. So we'll do player state dot ended, pass it the callback, and we'll also do timed metadata. We've talked, I've mentioned timed metadata a few times, but we haven't really talked about what it is. So we'll put a listener in here for a timed metadata, and it will receive an event. And we can log that event and see what's inside of it. And really quickly here, that just to show you some of the other things that are available with the player SDK, every one second we will dump out the player quality. So this is the actual quality that's being received on the stream that's coming in at that point. And because the IVS player uses some intelligent intelligence, it can actually detect when a network is not sufficient for the actual quality of video that it's streaming. We're talking about transcoded streams here, I should clarify. When there's different streams available, a 1080, a 720, if the network conditions dictate for whatever reason, maybe you disconnected from the LAN and now you're on Wi-Fi, or you've moved with your mobile to a other part of your house where the signal's not as good, the player will detect that network quality state change and it will lower your stream quality mid playback to keep the stream going, keep the, the buffer low, keep the latency low. So we'll get live latency and let's also get the buffer. All right, start up an HTTP server, open that up. So here's our player. If we start broadcasting, open up our console. Ooh, git buffer is not a function. Did I type it wrong? Get buffer duration, I'm sorry. So get buffer duration. All right, so we can see our stream is now playing because I started broadcasting it from the web broadcast SDK. And if I can make that font a little bigger, you can see that every second, the first object there is the quality object. So this is the current quality on the player. We have 1080p coming in. That's the codec being used. That's our current bit rate. So the actual, if you divide that by 1,000, you get kilobits per second. That's the current bit rate on your stream, your width and height. The second number there, 2.374, that's our current latency. So the latency that's between when our broadcast is started and our player is playing back. It's currently at 2.3 seconds. And then our buffer duration is currently two seconds. So that's playback with the player SDK. What other options do you have? Let me shut that down really quick. What other options do you have with the player SDKs? 
You do have the IBS player. As I said, it has that intelligence built in. It's honestly the best player to use for IBS playback because it has that adaptive bitrate playback quality to it. But we can also use VideoJS if you're already using VideoJS for something. If you use JW Player, there is an integration for that as well. VideoJS calls it a, I can't remember what they call it, but check our documentation. There's a certain terminology they use. It's not a plug-in, it's a tech, I think it's called. But as I said, you also have the Android and iOS playback SDKs. Do you have a question? Sorry? Cool, all right. We looked at channel playback already. Interactivity, how much time do we have left? We have not much time. So I'm not gonna demo it, but as I said, you do have chat rooms available to you. These are available by either the console, or the SDK, the CLI. You can create a room with CLI. You can Oh, create a token. So every time you connect to a chat room, you need a chat token. And the reason that this is done is to, so that you basically know users are connected, you can moderate their messages, you can disconnect them if they're abusing your community rules. So you have to have some kind of way to know that somebody is connected to your channel, right? Let's see how quickly I can code a chat room here. Sorry for all y'all coming in with your lunches. I hope you're enjoying my session. Uh, all right, chat. It's not really gonna take us long. So we, we need a chat token. We're gonna prompt for that. We need to specify an endpoint and we need to create a connection. So we'll do a new WebSocket. We'll pass it the endpoint and the token. And then we can simply listen for on message and we'll log out that message. And then we just need to send some messages. So we'll send some every few seconds here. So we have an interval. Every second we'll do a payload. It is now date.now. And then send the payload. So we should still be running our server. Come back here. We open chat. So it's asking us for a token. We can very quickly and easily create one via this CLI. Paste that in. Endpoint is not defined. What did I call it? Chat endpoint. So every second, it's sending a message to that chat room. This is the on message handler and it's receiving all of those methods, all those messages. So you can see the, if I expand that, you'll see the data, there's a content element, you can parse that out, get your JSON. You can get your user ID from that, you can pass along meta arguments, so if you wanted your chat username, for example, you could do that as well. So that is IBS chat, plenty more to learn about that, but just wanted to give you a quick overview of that, really easy to use. Thank you all for coming, sorry for everyone for running into your lunchroom, but glad to answer any questions, thank you.